119, verses 169 through 176. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my plea come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips will pour forth praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue will sing of your word, for all your commandments are right. Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you, and let your rules help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Again, we are going to be making our way through Ephesians 2, verses 2 through 10. But before we go there, let us first back up and review what we talked about last week so that we keep everything in its proper context. Now last week we made our way through chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, and then made our way into chapter 2. Now we learned at the end of chapter 1 of Ephesians that the very one, that being the Holy Spirit, who raised Christ from the dead and placed him on the throne in which he rules and reigns over all. That's taking place today. He rules and reigns over all. But the very one who placed him there dwells within the believer. That's what we have been promised. That's what the word tells us. Church, we were once fallen creatures, a God-hater, a rebel against God. And it was the Holy Spirit who gave us the ability to believe, to take us from that fallen state to where we denied the gospel, denied the truth, and He brought us, He regenerated us, giving us that new heart to where when we hear the gospel, we read it, we believe it, we cherish it, we crave it. Again, the same Holy Spirit who brought Christ back from the dead dwells within every single believer today. But the Holy Spirit doesn't just give us the faith to believe. No. For it is the Holy Spirit who seals that faith once and for all. For every believer is sealed permanently in Christ. So once the believer has been regenerated, that the Holy Spirit sealing them, then what takes place? The holy believer is brought to the church. The Holy, the holy Spirit is now part of the body. Now this is all still the working of the Holy Spirit driving the believer to this place. For if we, the believers, are the body, then who is the head, church? That is Christ. Christ is the head of the church. We also learned last week that the body of Christ isn't fulfilled until every one of his elect have been redeemed. What does that mean? That means that there will not be one single person that God has predetermined before the foundation of the world, that it was predetermined to come into the faith, there will be not one left. For God will rescue all of his elect, his adopted, his chosen. And once his elect have been brought together, that being in the, in the body of the church, it is then that the church is able to go about fulfilling the good works that will glorify God. 
Church, that's why we come together on Sundays and Wednesday. We come together to hear the word, to study the word, to hear the truth. And then what? We, we disperse into the world to tell others this truth. That's what we have been called to do. It's here where Paul, writing in the second chapter, tells the believers how they were once dead in their trespasses and sins. And this is so important because the the Protestant church has been in division over this for centuries. But it's important that we study the words, the truth, so that we know what is right. We know who we are now and who we were before the work of the Holy Spirit. Because every single believer in here today was once a fallen creature, a rebel against God. Every believer in here today was at one time spiritually dead. And what does that mean? Well, if one is spiritually dead, they cannot respond positively to the spiritual truth of Jesus being Lord and Savior. They cannot respond to that truth. Why? Because they live in the realm of trespasses and sins. They live in the realm where they run in the opposite direction of God. They don't want Him. They run from Him. They live in the realm where they will always fall short of any goal or any standard of God. This is the realm in which every believer lived in before his or her regeneration. Let's look at verse 2. Now we touched on this last week. It says, In which you once walked, Again, he's Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. So he's writing to the believers and he's telling them, this is how you once walked before the Holy Spirit regenerated that heart. And notice that there is only one path for the non-believer. There, there's not numerous paths. It's one and done. Don't let this slip by. in which you once walked. Continuing in this verse, it says, following the course of this world. So this is the way in which every non-believer is walking right now. These are the very steps that at one point in time you were taking. Following the course of this world. Now we have to understand that since the fall, that being in the garden, Adam and Eve taking that fruit from the tree in which God told them to not take from. One tree. They had one commandment. That's it, one. This one tree. And yet Satan enters the garden, lures them to that tree. Adam was supposed to be protecting the garden. But he didn't. He failed. Adam was supposed to be protecting his bride, and he didn't. He failed. Failed. And when they took from that tree, sin corrupted every single thing. Every single thing, church. Now, world here in the Greek, that being cosmos, does not simply represent the physical creation of the world. It's speaking of the world order, it's speaking of the world systems, its values. And the world system, since the fall, is corrupt. Its values are no longer godly. It's anti-God. And how do we know this? Well, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is telling us. 
Continuing this verse, it says that this world is following the prince of the power of the air. Now, the prince is in reference to Satan. Apart from Christ, we know that what? Man is a slave to sin. A slave to sin. Man is also a slave to his master, Satan. For he, that being Satan, is the spirit that influences those in this world. The non-believers. They are influenced by the spirit of Satan. The, The value system of this world is influenced by the spirit of Satan. Church, since the fall, from birth, man does not want God. And I'm going to continue to say this over and over again because this point needs to be driven home. Who you were before you were regenerated. Do you know what man wants in their fallen state? They want what their master wants, that being Satan. They want to be God. They want to be able to create what they want to worship. And what is it that they want to worship? It's the fallen values of this world. That's what man wants. They want the temporal and everything along with it. They want to fulfill their goals of their value system. Not God's system, but the world's. They want the wickedness of the world. This world is fallen and corrupt because the non-believer follows their commander. They are on his spiritual wavelength not God's. If you look at the world that we're living in today, the world is okay with women killing millions of babies every year for convenience. Right now, as of May 16th, 2021, 15 million babies have been slaughtered worldwide. The U.S. is responsible for killing 3,000 babies every single day. The world is okay with this. There's a TikTok channel where women are encouraged to film themselves bragging about how many abortions they've had. On that same channel, it's encouraged for women to list the amount of partners they've been with. We live in a world where men are encouraged to be effeminate and are discouraged to be masculine. If a man today shows the smallest amount of testosterone flowing through his veins, it's considered toxic masculinity. The world wants to empower whores and baby killers and lift up neutered men. Well, that's offensive. No, it's the truth. But but do you understand how soft we have become? The, the, The church should be outraged about these things. It's not godly. It's nowhere close to it. But the church today would rather entertain the people in the pews than tell them the truth. The 
This is who we once were. The ones who loved the world. A God hater. One who wanted to be their own God. Again, because that's what their previous master wanted. Continuing in the verse, it says, The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience for the non believer. Again, this means that there is only one option in who they follow before Christ. That one option, of course, is, is Satan. And it's because they despise God and they don't love all his attributes, they are sons of disobedience. See, it's in the same way in which Adam was lured to that tree and he sinned, so are his children. We we have to understand this, church. When we talk about race today, it's truly not in a biblical standard, a white, a black, a yellow, or brown thing. When, when we speak on race, it's biblical, and it's only this, those who are in Adam and those who are in the second Adam, that being Christ. For those who are in the first Adam, the non-believers, they willingly follow the prince of the power of the air. And they're not being forced to follow him. That is what they choose. That is what their nature wants. And because that is their nature, they will continue to disobey the laws of God. And again, I say this was the nature of every single person from birth until... God rescued them. This was you before God poured out his grace and mercy upon you. Now Paul's not done in describing how the believer once lived. Look at verse 3, continuing. It says, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. It's really quite plain, isn't it? Before Christ, you craved that which isn't godly. Now, for those who want to believe in free will, they will simply say, well, man just needs to make better choices. Man just needs to choose God. Well, church, that's the problem. It's not the choices they're making that is making them hate God. They make those choices they make because they hate God. Man's fallen heart doesn't want that which God wants. Man in his fallen state will continuously choose that which isn't godly. Now, that doesn't mean that man's fallen state is as wicked as it wants to be because even God's common grace falls upon the wicked, keeping them from being as wicked as they would want. Man in that fallen state does not want to please God. They only want to please themselves. They want to be their own God. And it continues. And were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, does this not go in the face that all humans are God's elect? That from birth man is good. Man only becomes a sinner when they commit their first sin. Says nowhere in Scripture. 
Let me read this again. And we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. For those who stay in the first Adam, they will be the object of God's damning judgment. So this all seems horrific. And it is. So far in this letter, Paul has laid out just how wicked and corrupt man is from birth. They despise the Creator. They want nothing to do with the triune God. I'll say this again to you. This is who you once were. That was your original nature. Your original fallen state put you in the category to be a child of God's wrath. That is simply terrifying. But there's good news. There's good news, church. Man would always be lost without a supernatural work from the Almighty God. And and here it is. So this is who you once were, wicked, corrupt. You wanted nothing to do with God. You ran from God. You hated His law. Your natural choice is not God. But look at verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy. Church's mercy is unlimited. That there is no sin that His own could ever commit against Him that His mercy would not cover. Listen to what I said earlier and what this world embraces. The, the, the very women who are murdering their babies. Do you know how many of them are God's elect? Do you know how many God has rescued that have done that? It is a beautiful thing. There is no sin too great, church, that the blood of Christ hasn't paid for. But God, being rich in mercy, God's mercy is so great. This is what He has given the wretched. This is what He has done for His children so He could reconnect with them. For it was God who reached out to the vile, the wicked, the rebel who mocked Him. And He brought them into salvation. This should be mind-blowing and earth-shattering. I don't care how many times you've heard this. For you were a rebel, a God-hater, and He rescued you. No sin too great, church. And why did He do this? Why did he rescue the wicked? Look at what it says. Because of the great love with which he loved us. Do you understand this love? That he sent his only begotten son? To pay the elect sin debt? I don't think there is a single person in here that would send their son... To pay the debt for a child killer. I don't believe there's a single person in here that would send their son to pay the debt, the crime of a pedophile. 
of a rapist, a terrorist. And yet this is what God did. This was his plan before the foundation of the world was to hang his son on a tree for your sins. It was your sins that nailed him there. And he did this out of love. For he provides salvation for his love, for his chosen, for his elect, for his adopted. And when did he do this? Look at verse 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, when you were spiritually dead, God rescued you. He rescued you from that sinful realm in which you once loved. Because as we know, from the writings that when man is spiritually dead they want nothing to do with God they don't want to be rescued why? because they love the realm in which they are in and when you think about the spiritually dead you think about a corpse does that corpse ever cry out to the doctor bring me back to life? no because it's dead. So what we see here that it is God who brings life to the believer. And he did so when you were dead in your trespasses. And continuing, he says, made us alive together with Christ. So far, everything that we have read so far, is there any part when it comes to your salvation that you did something? That did you do something for this gift? I mean, were you able to receive this wonderful gift because you're smarter than the next person? You were able to see the truth? Or was it because there was a righteous act that you committed? That you performed that a non-believer did it and that caught the eyes of God? No. It's none of those things. It's by what Christ did for you on your behalf. Why on your behalf? Because you couldn't do it. You didn't want to do it. So Christ did it for you. For it was Christ who went to the cross. It was Christ who took your sins upon himself. It was Christ who received the wrath of God on your behalf. And as we know, church, that when he was doing this, he was also imputing his righteousness to the believer. So on that day of judgment, when you stand before God, and he sees you clothed in the righteousness of Christ, know that you did absolutely nothing for it. So often the question that is asked is, so are you deep down, deep down, Brit? Are you saying that I did absolutely nothing for my salvation? Because that's what we're hearing over and over again. The only answer I can give to that is no, I'm not saying that. The word of God is. If 
Continuing. It says, by grace you have been saved. What is grace, church? It's unmerited favor or undeserved benefit. So what does that mean? You did absolutely nothing. For it was the triune God who did it all. You, believer, were redeemed, but not because of anything that you have done. Not by a good work, but by His grace and His alone. Look at what verse 6 says. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus It's absolutely amazing. One that God would rescue a single one of us. But because of Christ's work, the believer is no longer in the realm of spiritual death. For the believer is now in the realm of spiritual life. And all the of those, these, that came out funny. Now, although these mortal eyes of ours cannot truly see this, but it's already done. Yes, are are we here living in this fallen world now? Yes, but at the same time, we're also in the spiritual realm, in the heavenly realm with Christ Jesus. And do you know what this means for the believer? For the first time, You can flee from Satan. You can flee from the evils of this world. No longer are you in bondage to it. You have been freed from it. And and that's the truth, church. We, We live in this world, but you are not of this world. Because the believer who is in Christ, well, that means their citizenship is in heaven, even right now as we speak. That citizenship that you have is in the new heavens and new earth right now as we speak. Church, this is why when you look at the world that we are living in today, you see just how fallen it is. You have been given a new world view, a biblical world view. Your truth comes from the word of God, and anything that goes against it is evil. Look at verse 7. Continuing, it says, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now, this is speaking of the eternal reward that every single believer will receive. When their time here on this earth is done, God will pour out his grace on those who are in Christ Jesus, where his kindness will be on full display for all eternity. And why? So that he will be glorified in doing it. Now, of course, he has already shown us his grace and mercy while we are here on this earth. That's how we came to believe. But that heavenly realm, our minds just cannot fathom it we cannot grasp it in the here and now it is going to be like nothing we have ever known before to be able to love without sin to be able to see the triune God and worship him 
to see the very one who paid your sin debt in full. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And that love you have, it is going to be for all your brothers and sisters up there. It doesn't matter who they are, where they come from. That is your brother and sister in Christ. And many have said that there is no love like the love you have for your child. But even that love will not compare to that which is in the heavenly realm, to that which is going to be in the new heavens and new earth. This is what is promised to every single believer who is in Christ Jesus. Now this next verse is one of the most controversial verses in the church today. It shouldn't be. It should not be. But it is. The reason for the controversy is that we see in this verse, we learn from this verse, that our salvation has nothing to do with our own merits. It's all by the grace of God. You know why I think there's so much controversy that surrounds this verse? It's because you don't have real men as pastors anymore. There's not enough testosterone behind the pulpit to stand for the truth. Why is this verse in the Protestant church skipped over so much? Why is it not touched? You know why I think it is? Because it stings at first. But then you embrace it and you love it and you cherish it. See, man wants to be told that there is something good in them and that they did do something for their salvation. That's not what the word of God says. Look at verse 8. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Church, what is grace? It is something that cannot be earned. It is a gift from the almighty God. It is a divine gift from God. A divine personal gift given to the believer. And it's a gift that will never diminish. So God has given his elect this gift. The gift of salvation. And it's through faith. So here's the question. Here's the question that's often asked. All right, then, then where does faith come from? I, I mean, if, if salvation is a gift from God through faith, wh where's, where's faith? I mean, is it naturally in man? Is it there before God regenerates man's spiritually dead heart? No. No. In our fallen state, man does not have the ability to place their faith in God. And even if we did, church... Even if we did, then that would be a work on the believer's part. It would be a merit on the believer's part. And when we study these verses, what does it plainly say? That it is by grace that the believer has been saved. Do you, do you recall a couple of weeks ago when we talked about living in this post Postmodern world that doesn't hold to definitions any longer. You can change the word whenever you want to. The meaning of the word that is. I mean, we're seeing it play out right before our very eyes today where a man can claim to be a woman 
where a woman can now claim to be a man, it no longer has to do with our DNA, our biological makeup. It's just based on your feelings and emotions. We said this then, that's stupid. This is the reason why the church cannot follow the world. The world is dumb. When I was eight, I wanted to be Superman. My parents didn't encourage me to go jump off a tall building. Maybe some days they would have, but they didn't do that. Church, it is so important for us to understand the word of God. And that it is the everlasting truth. It does not change. This is the same reason why we can read dead theologians today and it is opening our eyes. Hundreds, thousands of years ago, these theologians have been dead, but they are still speaking the truth. And what the truth says is that all of this is by God's grace. It's by His free gift that the believer is saved. And and Paul really emphasizes this point. Look at what the rest of this verse says. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. (laughs) Man has not done a single solitary thing for their salvation. There, There is no work in them that can bring them to salvation. And if man has done nothing, church, then what does this mean? That God alone is the author of salvation. There is no controversy around this if we are to truly hold to what the word says. There's nothing about the merit of man when it comes to this free gift. Is there? Have I missed something? Was there something in a verse that I just leaped over? No. And then look what Paul says in verse 9. That it is not a result of works so that no one may boast. For my Presbyterian brothers and sisters in here. Our brother R.C. Sproul. In his commentary on Ephesians. He wrote this about this very verse. I love that line from Augustus, top lady's great hymn, Rock of Ages. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. The only merit that can get me into heaven is the merit of Jesus Christ. Paul says emphatically in Romans 3.20, No one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. The Bible explicitly says that no one will be justified through observing the law. Scares me every single time. So you have done nothing for this wonderful gift, this miraculous gift. Coming to a close. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We must understand that the performance of good works comes from our faith In Christ Jesus. When you were apart from Christ in your fallen state, you could not perform a good work. And many will ask, well, what about the non-believer that helps the little old lady across the street or carries her groceries into her house? That's a good work. In a worldly understanding, yes, but it was done out of a selfish act. There is no good work apart from Christ, church. There cannot be. It is stated. 
that ever, ever study like this. A man apart from Christ, paraphrasing, whenever he performs a good work, God sees it as a used minstrel rag. It's plain and simple. However, though, when one is rescued, when that one is brought into the faith, it is then that they perform good works. For the regenerated man is the workmanship of God. Again, this points us back to the understanding that there is no meritorious work that fallen man can do to receive salvation. For the believer is his workmanship, meaning that when God rescues that fallen man, they are now conformed to the image of Christ. And it is then in which the believer is now able to perform the good works that God has predetermined for his elect to do for his glorification. It's really quite simple with what the word says. You have done absolutely nothing to be rescued by God. Or you have done everything not to be rescued. And yet, because of his love for his own, he sent his son to pay your sin debt. He sent his son to receive the wrath that you deserve for your sins against him. It's the most beautiful news anyone should ever hear. And I don't care how many times you've heard it. But to love and to grasp the truth and that it was all the workings of God is beautiful in and of itself as well. Because without his works, you would still be on that path straight to hell. But because he rescued you, on that day when you stand before the Almighty, you will be seen as righteous, not because of anything that you have done, but what the Son has done for you. Let us pray.